white, young, blonde, thin, low slung jeans, tramp stamp in the back, you know, peer, um, pierced navel, all of these things. And this is what they get over and over again. Now, I think for those of us over the age of 35 or even over the age of 30, when we were growing up trying to figure out what it meant to be a woman, we had lots of choices. Not enough, of course, because we needed the feminist movement to expand our choices. But I remember thinking, you know, what, what fit for me? What fitted for me? What kind of identity as a woman made sense for me? And I had images to choose from that were not just the hypersexualized images. Today, those images have crowded out alternative images of being female. And what you have is women saying they choose this. But in reality, you can only choose something if you've got an array of choices in front of you. And increasingly, those choices are being limited because in, basically in our society, you can be visible or invisible as a woman. And what kid wants to be invisible? And you will be invisible if you don't look hypersex like your friend. And this is why there's this kind of push towards hypersexualization. So this is also what I hear from the girls and the young women. So basically, we have now women being socialized into hypersexualization, and we have boys being trained through pornography what sex looks like. No wonder there's that hook up sex. No wonder there's rape in hook up sex as well, which is what the studies are showing that more women get raped in hook up sex than any other relation, uh, connection or relationship. So these are the key issues I talk about. I also look at racism in pornography, which very few people actually have ever looked at. Now, what's interesting is one in four films released to the market is called Interracial. And this is a black man and a white woman. And this is geared to white men. So the question becomes, why do white men want to watch black men penetrate white women over and over again? And I was really thinking about this because, you know, it's not that long ago that black men got lynched for even the threat of such a thing. So what's going on? And then it dawned on me, if indeed pornography is about the debasement of women, what better way in a racist society to debase a white woman than have her penetrated over and over again by a body that has been marked as demonized, has been seen as deviant, i.e. the black male body? Because the history of racism in this society is the history of the demonization of black sexuality. And so what you see in pornography is the hypersexualization and the eroticization of racism, which has a profound effect on communities of color. So I go into the image of African American women, the image of African American men, I go into the women, image of Asian women and Asian men, and I really look at what it means to have white skin in the pornographic industry versus um, skin of color. So those are some of the issues that I talk about. I'm sure people have got some questions and issues and things you'd like to bring up. So rather than me just go on, I'm going to open it up to some questions. So I'll start by way of introducing my question by noting that uh, in Shakespeare there's a lot of uh, sex and violence, but I, I don't mention that to uh, endorse those things, but to mention that Shakespeare is with us today. The Drek he must have been competing with probably had plenty of it too, but was Drek and forgotten. And so I ask um, about your reference to all these video games. How do you avoid being accused of being a garden variety moral panic person who's talking about how Pinball and Elvis and the Beatles are going to ruin our nation as well. Okay, good question. Okay, because we always say, you know, every generation has said, oh, this is the end of the world. You know, the younger generation, just terrible. But let me tell you, we have never done this before. We have moved from a print-based culture to an image-based culture, where the, the, the main form of communication is the image. Now the image is increasingly pornographized. So the question becomes, what does that mean for boys to grow up in that? And I would say it, we are in serious, serious trouble. And I don't think we've ever been in a situation like that. And also to talk about moral panics, and one thing people often to call me is say, are you a prude? Well, let me say something. If I was speaking against fast food industry, if I was talking about the obesity and the health issues with fast food, would anyone accuse me of being anti-eating? So why when I talk about pornography am I accused of being anti-sex? It's the same thing. 
Pornography is the industrialization and commodification of sex. It's not sex. Just as fast food is not just food, it's the commodification and industrialization of it. So what I'm talking about is an industry, specifically an industry. So this is not an issue about being a moral panic or being a prude. It's an issue about a huge industry that is having an enormous impact on our culture. I was wondering if you've done any work with Professor Catherine McKinnon, or if you've you know worked with her. Well, heard of her. She's very you know well known. Um, could you comment on that? Yes, um, I've, quite a while ago actually, we brought the uh, Dworkin McKinnon legislation to Boston. And we try to basically define pornography as a violation of women's civil rights or anyone's civil rights who's harmed in it. So we brought that to Boston. And I have to tell you, I have a kind of progressive understanding of capitalism. Never, though, have I seen the forces of capitalism marshal itself against a piece of legislation. Even the guy who was running the hearings, who had been a long time, you know, assistant and aide to the rep, said he had never seen anything like the onslaught against this bill. He said not even the insurance industry is this bad. So, I mean, that's the kind of stuff, that's what happened when we worked with yeah, Catherine McKinnon and the late Andrea Dworkin. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Uh, I was reading Common Sense a second ago and I was thinking, what would Payne think about this? Um, like, essentially, like, a, from a girl from Manchester, I mean, I would like to know your perspective on how you think at least, well, there used to be a bridge between the between America and Europe and now that bridge seems to be ever closer. The discrepancy seems to be closer together. And I was thinking to myself, do you see, with the proliferation of the internet, mass communication, all these things, do you see the bridge coming closer together? And what do you think the You mean of the countries coming together? Well, at least our thoughts on sexuality towards it. Yeah, I think that's a great question because what pornography does is it universalizes the way we think about sex because the internet is everywhere now and pornography is one of the most downloaded, as you know, it's one of the most sought after um, images on the internet. So I would say that even cultural differences, cultural divides are now breaking down thanks to this sort of gen generic, plasticized, formulaic image of sex, which is what pornography is. So I think the divisions are going to, you're going to see a lot less. Yes, thank you. I have a question. Yeah. Um, actually, I have a f few, but I'll just ask two. The first is more about how you were able to talk to people in the industry themselves and have them open up about this, because to me, I'm thinking they would want to guard their thoughts. If you're an outsider who's already, whom they may already sense is sort of against, is against their industry, how did you get them to open up? You know what's really interesting is when I was there at the um, expo, it's three days long, and you know what? They were bored. That they were just simply bored and I would go and talk to them they say come and sit down they'd be thrilled to talk about it it was amazing I went through notebook after notebook taking notes and just to say what I didn't say is you know interesting I got an email last week from one of the porn producers I interviewed and he said he'd read my book I'm one of the porn producers and I want you to know you're extreme you're exactly right he said I've left the porn industry everything you say about pornography is true and at the moment we're having conversations because he's telling me what really went on behind the seeds and this was a man who made pornography for 15 years so yeah that's that and so they did open up and then just my second question is more about how do you talk to someone to the men out there you know we all have brothers you know friends guy friends that watch porn see porn how do you talk to them in a way that's not abrasive because I'm sure they're going to be sensitive anyway if the whole point is that it demoralizes women how do you talk to them so that they get your world and get where you're coming from and That's a really hopefully good shift question. their their way of being. Well, you know, I say to my students, look, you're not going to, if you're looking to date a guy, the chances of you finding a guy who's not used pornography is very, very low. But everyone's entitled to one mistake. That's fine. Okay. But now you're dating him and now you're talking about pornography and why you don't want him to use it, then he has to stop. What I say to women is you cannot be in a relationship with a man who is using pornography and it be an equal one because pornography is about the inequality between women and men. Now, how do you do it? You have to talk to them. There's lots of stuff. There's a group that I belong to called Stop Porn Culture. And if you go to stoppornculture.com, there's lots of resources on there, lots of articles. And you need to basically introduce the men in your life to a critical analysis of pornography. Because many men have never thought critically about it because when they look at pornography, they're aroused.
and you try and have a rational discussion with an erect penis, it doesn't work, okay? So they need not to be aroused and to talk about it. So have a look for the resources on Stop Porn Culture. Yes, hello. Hi, that was a very nice presentation. Um, by listening to you, uh, a scene came to my mind of uh, an old movie, uh, Last Tango in Paris. Yeah. And this is when Marlon Brando uh, has many, many names to name the, uh, the male organ. And most of those names are uh, vulgar. So my question is, um, I'd like to know whether you think that pornography is uh, a... I don't want to say collateral damage, spin-off of Western civilization and Christianity with the idea that, you know, the sin, uh, the sex is something that is, uh, I think is similar to the question that the gentleman asked, but with a spin towards the, the, the cultural influence of uh, Western, as I said, Christianity and our world. Okay, I mean, you know, how, why have we got a porn industry? You can't, as a social scientist, I can't find one reason. There's multiple ways. I think one of our views about sex as being being sort of dirty has bleeds into pornography because if you look at pornography you know sex is considered dirty in pornography she is considered dirty the names they always call her have got the word you dirty whore you dirty this you dirty that but I think what I try to say is look you know we've probably always had pornography around us but what's critical when we look at pornography is we have to look at it as an industry and it began in 1953 with the first edition of Playboy. So what I'm interested in is less so in looking at sort of the, the vast you know, issues out there and really honing in on how the industry developed from 1953 to present day to understand how it functions. And it functions as all other industries do. So if you ask me why there's so much pornography around today, I would say because it has become a massive industry, because it is profit driven, because it exists within a capitalist market. And the goal of the pornographers, of course, is to make money that's why you've got such a big industry and the fact that it's delivered through the internet is crucial because now it's so accessible that changed the face of the industry as a follow-up if, if I may a quick question what's uh, how many billion dollar a year is this they, they say I mean it's very hard to estimate but one of the figures that's uh, branded around a lot is 97 billion dollars a year 13 billion in America 97 billion around the world thank you very much I'm interested in uh, some of the questions that you posed. Uh, I got here a little late, so maybe you've already approached them, so forgive me. But uh, one of the things you said was, um, what do men get out of ATM? Now I'm wondering, did you interview men who said, yes, I practice that, and find out what they do get out of it? Um, one question. Go yeah. ahead. I Let me answer that and then I'll come back to another one. Okay. Let me tell you that I haven't specifically interviewed men on that. What I did do is I went to the porn discussion boards, which is where the aficionados of porn hang out, basically. And I read what they were saying about ATM. And there is a thread called Messy ATM. And in this thread hundreds and hundreds of postings talking about how great it is to watch the woman literally have to eat feces without knowing it and how thrilling that was and they even tell you at what point in the movie to go to so you can see her doing it and that she didn't know it and they said one guy said this was a moment of zen in pornography I've never reached before so I, this is what they like the debasement if this if what they write is basically true I've heard when they make those films they actually try to show you that it's ATM but it isn't it's A and then clean up and no, then, no. but I've heard that, yeah, uh, no. that no, they don't not try and clean up. No, they don't try and clean up in the films. No. They get, create the, I've heard they create the impression that yeah. they're not. Question, sir? Yeah. Uh, but the uh, other question is uh, when you interview these people, it seems to me that uh, you have to have a lot of controls to get anywhere close to the truth. The context in which you, you ask it, the um, how do you filter out whether people are just trying to uh, appear t to give the right answers as opposed to the, the real feelings that they have about something. I mean, it just seems to me that any uh, psychological and sociological studies need a great deal of control to get anywhere close to the truth. No, and of course, and obviously the more you interview and the more you begin to see patterns, I mean, as sociologists, as a sociologist, well, I look for patterns, and I began to look at patterns of what they were saying. I want to say as well, a lot of the research in here is actually from the porn industry itself because I read adult video news which is the trade paper of the porn industry also XBiz which is their business um, website so I mean it's not just through interviews it's also through what they're talking about in their actual press and I think what happens when you interview them I have to say a lot of them 
were really opened up about the industry. And what's good about when this guy contacted me, the producer, and said, you know, you were right, and we've had long conversations so far of an hour or so, and then we're going to have more. He's basically saying the same things I've heard over and over again. I've not heard anything different. So that's how I do. Thank you. Just quickly, uh, okay. I don't think, uh, I don't think I've... I'm sorry, we need... Thank you.